Hey everybody and welcome back. Today I'm going to do something a little bit different and tell you it's going to be okay. Look, I'm there with you. You've been working on your form for weeks, months, years even. You're dissatisfied. You know something looks wrong. Maybe you have an idea about what's wrong. Maybe you have an idea about how to fix it. Maybe you don't. Maybe you looked at the latest release from your favorite YouTube channel and you found it absolutely mind-opening. And then you tried it out and you just couldn't get it to work in the field or in your basement or in your net. And you went back to the archives from 1965 to the original disc golf throwing theory. And you tried it and yet you failed. You found it inscrutable. Alas, what do we do next? I hear you. I am you. And what I want to do is tell you it's going to be okay. What I thought I would do today is, given the absolute uptick in content out there, understandably people see a lot of information and think that there's a conflict in concept. There's maybe a conflict in words. There's a conflict in the basic principles of throwing and, and how we should understand it and indeed learn or do it. And what I want to do is take, I guess, my impression of what I've noticed from the last six months or so about what's happened on the public scene and use a case study of myself as a student and talk through what we should be thinking at that moment when watching that player's movement. And we're going to decide, is this player okay? And how is it going to be that way? Now, I'm going to try and say several instructive things about form, all of which I'm focusing on because of somewhat controversial issues or perceived controversial issues in content that you may have encountered. In my day job as an academic, I think about phrases like distinction without a difference, right? A difference in, in phrasing or concept that apparently means that A and B are not the same, but in fact, to at least some approximation, they are. And therefore, an argument about it may, may not be as big of an issue as we think it is. Or maybe there's a, a distinction in emphasis. Um, and I think a lot of the issues we'll come to see show us that context matters. Context in the content. Context in the sense of the instructor and what they're trying to teach you. Context in your own motion and the way your brain and their body work enable to, and it, that enable you to enact certain things in a throw or another move. So... Let's try this out, and if you like this, um, you can let me know in the comments, and I can take more of a fireside chat approach to some of the issues in mechanics chatter or the broader disc golf instruction community. Oh, this player is in his basement. Is this okay? Well, he's recently the father of two. He's full-time employed in moonlighting as a part-time disc golf instructor and enthusiast. So he's not getting out of the field very much. Now, is it okay to throw into a net? These are constraints that we're given. Some of us just don't have the time. Um, our life circumstances make certain things harder to do, even if they're more efficient or ideal for development. So in that context or constraint, sure, throwing in the net is okay. So how do we talk about making that effective in that case and for this player? Well, we have a few things going on. This player's adapted the environment such that um, we have a heavily fortified bunker of blankets, some off screen here. Um, so there's uh, additional padding between this player and the exit speed of that disc and other things that he might care about. Fine. What is this player's intent? Well, he probably wants to throw his preferred driving hyzer flip angle into that net. He has a sort of line approximated in his head. He has uh, intentionality through the eyes toward the intended apex of that shot. And so he's probably simulating uh, holes that he's using regularly and then queuing those up shot by shot and then adjusting a thing at a time in the motion pattern. Okay, so we can convert constraints into their most usable form using uh, mental tricks, using preparedness, right? And thinking about, well, wh what can we get out of it? And what we shouldn't expect to get out of it necessarily 
are the most ideal looking uh, flights to specific holes. You know, we could go in here and we could simulate with our tech, tech disc and get some sort of estimate of a good flight. But of course, we all know the, the reality is you've got to just see how those Frisbees fly. So the good news is that um, this player can, when playing the rounds he gets in the precious time he has, be very intentional about connecting what he does and learns in the round with what he does in the basement. So step one is use your intentionality when you have constraints in your time and your environment, and it's going to be okay. All right, so let's watch some of the mechanical points. So this player has been having a heck of a time on his transition move in his X step for basically as long as he's been working on it. And this player is probably very much like you, that unless you're already at the top level of the Pro Tour, you probably have some kind of uh, inefficiency in your motion somewhere. And I have to tell you now, seeing hundreds of cases at this point, that the transition move in the X step is, is probably the number one area that players struggle with for the longest, even if other things are working pretty well. And it's also a gatekeeper to uh, efficient and higher end power in the limit. Um, so again, if you don't convert your momentum into something useful and preserve it and, and get it into the disc, you're, you're really just kind of venting energy and opportunity. So what this player has been doing is dipping in to a reservoir of motor learning. And so given that there have been struggles to obtain the correct kind of tilted balance, which we'll describe in a second, um, in that move, well, what's another context where this player has found some adequate tilt? And we know of this player that he was a dancer. He waltzed not at the level of these dancers, but at a sort of intermediate level. And what waltz has baked into intermediate and on ups instruction is this concept of tilt. And the interesting thing about balance is that once you understand where it is, which you can't see on camera, it help explain it helps to explain certain motions. So for a long time, I had, I had known, but not physically understood in my body, how to control posture moving off this rear side through the X step to have an adequate tilt that will help carry my momentum forward and put my body into postures that are more naturally powerful, like we see in disc golf and other athletic regimes. And so um, as we watch the player cue back here, this is uh, an adaptation of a waltz posture. So as a, a dancer would come back into the tilt for their box step with their dance partner, they're cueing that balance back from the top of their head here all the way down toward the, the outstep of the foot down here. And so what that does is as we tilt kind of in what I call the north-south direction, where if north is toward the T, in this direction, then south is kind of back behind me. Um, I'm gonna have a bit of an aggressive tilt. That means that as soon as I start tapping, stepping, I'm not tipping off, but my balance is gonna carry my momentum naturally forward into the next step. So that's critical because a lot of uh, people have their balance basically in the opposite direction. They're going to be blocking their momentum forward basically before they start moving. And so notice that the disc is held in a chest, chest trapping posture. This is a, a concept from uh, golf where um, like you'll see that there's still this cradle formation. I've got a strong position with the closed shoulder and the disc cradled in here. Because of the balance tilt, as soon as I stride off at this moment, I've already got an athletic motion queued up here. And so you're gonna see here that as I allow that pendulum pump to come forward, I'm carrying through the momentum, which is carrying my X step forward, which now is going to just make this entire transition move happen to go more aggressively toward the target. And I say happen to go more aggressively toward the target because there's nothing really like forced about the way my legs or body need to move. They're working. My legs are still the thing that are most gassed after I'm throwing a lot at this point. Um, but they're doing the minimal amount of work to keep my body accelerating toward the target is the key. And so again, this all comes from a waltz tilt posture trick, right? By initially putting the balance tilt in the right position and coming off of that, it's easier to remain in that tilt moving forward. And we're going to get to a couple of limitations to that in a second. So you'll notice I still have this big honking pendulum pump. Is this okay? It depends. So what's the goal here? You notice that 
um, classic control drive golfers, uh, Barry Schultz comes to mind. Um, you might think of uh, Philo Brathwaite. You might think of Paul Macbeth in his younger years. You might think of Scott Stokely. Pendulums were very common at one point. They've become in decreasingly common. You'll see more elbow pumps if you see pumps at all. Uh, Isaac Robinson has a pretty aggressive pump, recent world champion. Uh, but this full pendulum is pretty rare. So um, I personally, you know, I, I don't know. Talk, you're going to have to talk to some pros to really know what they think about this. Was this just sort of a, a drift in form over time or is there really um, clearly some advantage over um, this? I think certainly um, pumping has some tricks involved like a lot needs to be going well this is like a deceptively athletic move it turns out like i have to be committing a lot of momentum through my arm and i have to be doing that through my whole posture to make sure i'm staying in balance coming back to keep the disc trapped by the time i land here uh, and start to to commit the move into the release so this is a pretty big dynamic move now for somebody as i've said before shaped like me uh, i've done extensive testing of the options here, uh, it is just easier for me to get my momentum moving, period. My, the, if the average male arm is about 12 pounds, I, as a former bodybuilder, mine is heavier than that. That is a lot of mass swinging freely to help my body move forward. And so at this point, um, you can call it uh, old school or compensating, it's going to be okay. This is just something I'm going to do when, when I throw or when I see a player like this throw. Um, so. Getting in this transition move and the players, you know, getting a, a decent commitment on the disc. So let's go back to this concept of balance and notice that there's still actually a little bit of a tilting away posture here. And I want to zoom us back in this motion to the X step. And so even here, notice that my posture still has a little bit of a tilt away. And so if we size this player up and ask, is this okay? Well, first of all, you will see this posture in some high level pro movement. And I think that there's a lot of sophistication in most of the transition moves by the time people get to the top level. In this case, we know something very specific about this particular player, which was interesting and that was underestimated by him and his coach until there was some self-diagnosing going on. So if we were to zoom in, to this leg and look inside of it, what would we see? Well, this player had what's called a spiral fracture when he was 12 years old. A normal lower leg looks like that on the left. And so in this anatomy, we're going to see, you know, sort of vertically, you have the tibia and the fibula. Uh, they're connected to one another. They can kind of, as the leg rotates, they sort of twist around one another and um, naturally handle torque. Well, a spiral fracture takes those bones and shears them long ways. It's a, it's a torque that the bone isn't taking and it snaps. Yeah, it's pretty grotesque. Um, this bone remodeled in uh, a configuration where the bone is actually at an unnatural slant. The fibula was disconnected and rebridged back over to this bone. Uh, there's a big knob of bone in the middle of um, that tibia. And uh, the leg is also shortened because developmentally it happened early enough in life. Well, what does that mean? That means that this player um, again, having diagnosed this kind of thoroughly and previously worked with uh, sports medicine, well, the way that this person's gait move moves is even a little bit different. And so what should we expect to be happening in this transition move? Probably, no matter how balanced this player gets, and if the preferred balance would be to have the body maybe tilted even more aggressively forward, well, a combination of a shorter leg um, strange sort of leverage process coming up through that leg. Uh, there's a little bit of pathological weakness in the leg musculature in some places. Uh, it, you're going to have to cut a player a break at a certain point. And so when you're working with yourself, when you're, you're talking with the coach, when you're you know doing work to, to get better at these things, this is a whole body move, a whole body assessment, a whole body context, a whole body history. And so be kind to yourself. Right. Try to understand what are the attributes of, of yourself. Where are you now? Where, where can you be in the future is bounded by all kinds of things. And so uh, for this player, for myself, starting to understand better what was going on this rear side made a lot of sense out of what this player was struggling with. 
helped this player understand, I think, more in, in a healthy way, well, where can we really expect to be in the future? And uh, allows that player then to think about, well, what adaptations and form could be helpful in the context of something that was uh, a residual injury and in, in a, a gait impairment in this case. Okay, so this player's working with their pendulum. You saw their big vertical transition move. So this player is working here with a, a, a large hop. There's a big vertical transition as they hop and stride off of this leg, and they're able to commit power through that move into their shot. You can convert that same sort of move and manipulate the momentum more horizontally in that case. You can do things like mess around with the, the pump. And so if we kind of take that a little bit more in a diagonal path here and then watch how it changes the overall shape and fall through of that move. Is this okay to mess around with these different forces and, and variability? Well, it depends on what we want to learn. If we want to learn something about how we can commit um, forces coming in through a hop and get a free gravity force, this kind of move will help teach you something like that. If you want to learn about running uh, sideways down the T and figure out how that commits force, this move will teach you something about that. If you're sort of interested in like the relationship between the leverage and sequence in your arm and your grip and, and your posture overall and how those can be harnessed for horses together rather than separately, messing around with the pump a little bit and seeing what happens in your body will probably help you with that. So it's okay to explore certain things. Now, it's helpful when you have somebody with a guide, with a, a structure, with experience that can help you to contextualize and work on those things. Um, but, you know, there's this, this concept in my day job of exploration versus exploitation. You explore if you think there are things out there that you could still obtain that potentially are more rewarding than what you have now. You exploit when you found something that is working for you and you commit to it. And so what is happening in my form at this moment back into it in earnest again is some of these tilt tricks, some of these momentum tricks with the pump, some of the leverage tricks with the way the grip works and the way that my hips transfer power through the ground now are working better again, better than ever. I get more power off these three steps more easily uh, than ever before. Um, this is the sort of thing where I'm going to exploit what I found. I'm going to explore a little bit around it and it's going to be okay.